and thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, I'm here to talk about math. Um, <laughs> definitely. So just to kind of get started, just kind of like set the tone um, and give an overview. Um, we need to just quickly refresh on, on the standard library. So the standard library is often the developer's first introduction to math and JavaScript. So in ES5, you had a collection of about 18 different functions covering trigonometry to special functions to other utilities. In ES6 and ES2015, um, we introduced 17 more functions, uh, notably some other trigonometric functions, uh, plus some higher order special functions and some utilities. And the grand total that we have is about 35 different pieces of functionality uh, plus eight constants. So just to kind of do a comparison and what you might get in the standard library in other languages, um, so let's take a look at Golang. Uh, so in Golang, what you'd also see is you'd see trigonometric functions, special functions, higher order, some utilities, as well as uh, low level functions for manipulating floating point numbers. In total, uh, Golang has uh, 54 different functions in its standard math library, plus eight different PRNGs, so to create uh, pseudo random numbers, uh, plus support for 64-bit complex numbers, 128-bit complex numbers, and big int, big float for doing, uh, for supporting applications in cryptography as well as arbitrary precision arithmetic. So you might be asking like, so what? Why do we care about uh, Golang having a bigger standard library than, than JavaScript? Um, two points. Um, one is that um, JavaScript for being a 20, plus year old language is still quite deficient in terms of its standard library and in terms of math. Um, it still has quite a ways to go. The second reason is that um, these functions that you get out of a standard math library are, are quite critical. They're fundamental building blocks to doing any kind of higher level math, like machine learning or statistics or any kind of numeric computing. And it's really critical that these standard math functions are accurate and they're performant. Because if they're not accurate, those errors propagate to downstream consumers. Such so if you have a small error in one of your functions, let's say calculating the, the power of the exponential, uh, you'll do some machine learning algorithms, you'll find out that you, your results significantly deviate from your expectations. And this can all be traced back to these, uh, these low-level primitive standard math functions. So it's really critical that we get these things right, uh, because errors matter. So, Speaking of errors, let's talk about some bugs that we find in V8. And to kind of like set the stage um, in terms of V8 and Node, just as a refresher, as a reminder, um, every version of Node is associated with a particular version of V8. The, the versions can fluctuate a little bit depending on what uh, version of Node you have, but by and large, uh, there's a major version of V8 associated with Node. And why this is important is because, um, take for example, Node V4, which has an end of life uh, in 2018, well, by that point, its uh, associated version of V8 will be nearly two years old. So if during the interim there have been any bug fixes or, or fixes in terms of accuracy and precision, those older LTS versions of Node uh, will not benefit from those, 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 uh, those fixes, right? So even if everything in the most modern version of V8 is up to date and good, there are still older versions of V8 that will be out there. And that's the thing, is that versions of V8 have a relatively long lifespan in the Node community. Um, and you need to be aware of this. And what this means is that old bugs in V8 are still bugs because of people who encounter them on their everyday applications. So in terms of particulars, if we go back all the way to Node 0 0.10, math sine and cosine are not accurate. Um, you can get back uh, values of the wrong sine and also the wrong magnitude. Going forward, NANs. Um, most people think that there's only like one NAN in JavaScript. And by the specification, yes. Um, however, in the underlying implementations, you can get distinguishable NANs. And you can actually see this if you um, put NANs into typed arrays and you actually look at the underlying bit sequences, which we can do here um, by overlaying an int32 array. And we see that actually the underlying bit sequences are different. And this is because NANs are not canonicalized on write in terms of performance. Uh, but they are on read. So if you're doing some kind of low-level float manipulation, you need to be aware that um, the underlying bits of NANs in JavaScript may not be what you think they are, right? And this is not necessarily a bug. Having distinguishable NANs is actually a good thing, uh, at least in my opinion, 
because if you it gets JavaScript a little bit closer to the IEEE 754 floating point spec. Um, however, if you're not aware of it, it can lead to subtle bugs in your applications. Uh, I put a star next to 0 0.10 because it just so happens uh, that on certain Windows systems, you can manipulate the bits of a NAND and a typed array, and you can generate a NAND which equals itself. So another implementation that's not accurate is MathPow. Um, here we're just doing 10 to the 308, um, and we don't get back 10 to the 308, and that's a difference of about three ULP, which is greater than the uh, specification says for one ULP. And the reason is, is because V8 uses a fast algorithm for integer inputs. And if you were to kind of log the values um, at each iteration, you'd see that on the third iteration, we start accumulating errors. And this leads to significant deviations in the final output for integer inputs. Uh, I know, because I end up having to fix bugs related to this. Um, and maybe you're thinking, okay, well, maybe some of the older things are, are a little bit off, but what about some of the newer stuff, like uh, ES2015, ES6 functions, like hyperbolic arctangent? Unfortunately, from 0 0.12 up to, zero, to version 6, they're inaccurate, as well as hyperbolic arc cosine, inaccurate. Um, and then finally, hyperbolic arc sine is also inaccurate. And if you look at, at the example, it, it, it's not particularly accurate for uh, small values and large values. And the reason is, is if we look at the algorithm that is used for, math, uh, for hyperbolic arc sine, um, we see that for small inputs, um, we end up doing, you multiply a small input by itself, well that gives you an even smaller input, one plus something that's negligible is just one, uh, so you start to underflow. And if you have a large input, well a large value, like 10 to the 200 times itself, overflows to infinity. Um, so it's not gonna handle, it basically treats all values as the same when a more accurate algorithm would actually treat values differently based on magnitude. So this is an implementation out of FD LibM, which is part of like Sun OS, the LibM, uh, family of, of math functions. And we notice that for small values, we apply one approximation, for larger values, we apply another, and then so on and so forth. And this allows us to increase our precision and our accuracy. Um, math exponential is also inaccurate. Um, in this case, it's off by 26 ULP, units in the last place. Um, and this becomes even more apparent when you actually look at a plot um, comparing uh, math exp compared to a reference implementation, and we see that in 0 0.10, we're not too far off. Uh, but once you get, there's a change in V8 between 0 0.10 and 0 0.12, such that the implementation is actually quite far off from the reference implementation. Um, so we see in 0 0.12 all the way up through version six. Um, once you get to V7, things are remedied, right? But this is, a, this is a big problem, right? Because calculating e to the x is fundamental in many different applications. So if you're trying to have high precision results in your numeric computing library, well, you're gonna have to contend with this. Um, next, we have math random. So in older versions, like pre-version five in, in Node, um, V8 used this particular algorithm for its uh, PRNG, uh, pseudo-random number generator. And it is the NWC 1616, uh, multiply with carry, and you combine two 16-bit parts to create a 32-bit integer. Um, there's a number of issues that are wrong with this PRNG. Um, one is that it has a relatively small period. Uh, two, uh, it basically fails most like, statistical tests for evaluating PRNGs. And then three, it's subject to poor uh, initial seed states. Um, that even shorten the life of the PRNG even more. Uh, so it's just been kind of like not a good thing. And in fact, the author, original author of this PRNG way back in the day, like a couple weeks later, came out with a new edition that used an, an, an XOR. Um, suffice it to say, it's not a good one. And this comes back to bite people when they actually try to use it in production. So if anyone has followed along with the Bettable story, um, which was quite public uh, a year or so ago, Basically what they were trying to do is um, they were trying to create unique IDs that were gonna propagate throughout their system. And how they were gonna do that, they had like 64 characters, and they said, all right, we're gonna create a unique ID that's 22 characters in length. If we have a good PRNG, that should give us about two to the 132 different unique IDs, all right? Possibility of collision is pretty, pretty, pretty small. Um, however, the PRNG that you saw before, the higher order bits are basically controlled by only 16 bits. 
which effectively reduces the uh, cycle length. So what actually ends up happening is that you only get two to the 30 unique values, which means that your pro probability of collision is much, much greater, right? And this is actually what they found out in production. Um, because of a poor random number generator, they had a whole bunch of duplicate IDs flooding through their system. That's not a good thing. And just to kind of bring home this point that the PRNG was not particularly good, on the left is a plot of random values produced by this PRNG. And as we see, there's actually quite a bit of structure in the image compared to the right-hand image, which is when V8 went to an XOR shift, which gives the appearance of being much more random. And that's kind of a hallmark of a good PRNG is that it needs to give the appearance of being random. And unfortunately, um, the one on the left doesn't really do that. So that's V8 in math right now, right? Is that um, across the different implementations, you have very inconsistent results, you have a lack of precision. And this isn't to say that the V8 team hasn't worked to fix this, right? In the most recent version of V8, like they've been working hard to standardize all their math implementations, et cetera. And this isn't V8 specific, right? This happens in Spider Monkey. I haven't really evaluated in Chakra. I'm sure they've done amazing stuff. Um, but there are bugs elsewhere, right? Um, and part of it is it's not just like there are bugs, but another reason why math in V8 is broken is because it's broken really at the standards and the implementation level, right? At just JavaScript as a language. Not to rain on JavaScript's parade, but there's a lot of work that we need to do. And there are basically 10 reasons why at the specification level it's a little bit broken. Um, first is that it's underspecified. Um, in the, if you read ECMA 262, um, you will see that uh, they don't mandate a precision. They recommend one EULP, but it's not required. And they don't recommend a particular implementation, which means that, and traditionally, browser vendors and those implementing the spec have been able to choose and favor speed over precision, um, which is okay for certain applications, but certainly not for numeric computing. And this is really evident when you start looking at cross-browser, and you can basically just think about cross-environment variability in the sense that you, know, you have no guarantees what implementation you are actually using when you go uh, deploy your application somewhere, whether it's in the browser or on a certain node version. Um, there's no single code base, right? It's not like an R or Julia or Python where there's like one source of truth. Because of all the different browser vendors and the different implementers, you have many sources of truth, and that's hard if you want to push the agenda forward of math and JavaScript. Another reason is versioning, right? I could basically reboot my computer now and restart Chrome, and I can't guarantee that the version of math sign is the same one I started with, right? This notion of evergreen browsers is good, but it also comes with some downsides. Notably, I have no choice, like I don't have any decision, it's a black box in terms of what implementation I am given when. And that's an issue, because that makes it hard to do reproducible numeric computing, and it also affects portability. The next thing is required shims. Well, if you need to smooth out all these inconsistencies in browser behavior and also in Node, um, and you're always having to push this down and use these things, it kind of begs the question why you need a native implementation to begin with, because uh, you're already having to use third-party code. Another issue is globals. Um, the fact of the matter is, is JavaScript traditionally has been kind of a hostile environment. Um, people are always think they have a better implementation, they're overriding globals. You really have no guarantee that what you're using is the right thing. You can't guarantee that when I put my application along with someone else's code, they haven't overridden um, MathPow and in favor of some like fast implementation rather than a more precise implementation. And that's an issue. Um, another one is testing. Is that the spec doesn't mandate any particular testing, right? And if you look traditionally at uh, math implementations in JavaScript by the different uh, implementers and vendors, um, testing hasn't, has been a bit wanting, yeah? And because they're not really comparing against like standard implementations, like you should. If you really want to be thorough, you need to be testing against like, let's say, Boost or Cephes or uh, FDLibM or something else. You really need to be rigorous about your testing or else you're going to have bugs. And that's been kind of the history of math and JavaScript. Next is that there are no golden algorithms. Um, people think that we can solve the math problem just by finding that one unique algorithm. There is no unique golden algorithm. Right? Um, people will commonly say that, okay, we, we, need to use a, we need to use PCG, which is a particular type of uh, PRNG, random number generator for JavaScript. But the fact of the matter is, one 
random number generators are going to cut it. When you want to do serious numeric computing, you need to have multiple different generators to make sure that what you're doing is not an artifact of the generator itself. So it's not like we fix it by just fixing the spec. There's a much bigger issue that's fundamental at the language level. Next is this time scale. In order to go from specification to implementation, it takes years, right? I, it's hard to say whether that's worth it. You can move a lot faster at the community and user land level than you can at the specification level. And that's just been traditionally the case. Mozilla knew about uh, their PRNG, um, the random number generator being weak, back in 2006. It wasn't fixed until 2016. Same thing with V8 and their random number generator. It took a long time to get it fixed, and it takes a long time to get through things through at the specification level. And that's also why it's uh, a bit trying and a bit wa uh, wanting um, to do math in JavaScript. And lastly, is this kind of underscoring everything, is this trust. Um, there's a fundamental trust issue here that I can't rely upon uh, various implementations, native implementations in the browser being right, or performant, or accurate, or anything. Um, and so, if that's the case, I'm just not going to use anything. So that's kind of dire. Um, might be a bit depressed at this point. So maybe you can think, oh yeah, I'll use some community solutions. That's right. Maybe, what I'll, maybe the answer here is that I'll use polyfills, and ponyfills, and shims, and shams, and we'll be good. We'll just patch over everything. It's great. So let's look at one. This is a polyfill for uh, hyperbolic arc sign. If this code looks familiar, it should, because it's the exact same implementation that we saw before. Uh, the reality is that many of the polyfills and ponyfills that you see on NPM are just not very good. Sorry to say. This one, in fact, comes from a rather highly regarded and highly prolific package author, um, giving it an air of credibility when it deserves uh, no such thing, right? Um, many things that are implemented in NPM are implemented by people that shouldn't be doing it, right? So you need to be very aware of this. At this point, you might be going, okay, well, maybe what I'll use is dedicated math libraries to fix my problems, right? Surely people that are doing math will have thought about this and figured out a solution. So let's look at that. Here is an implementation that I found um, that I picked right, like yesterday, um, from a very popular and uh, well-regarded math library that has like 4,000 stars, 150 different watchers, and uh, 50 different contributors. And this is what you get. Um, and this is what the lesson here should be that social indicators are really poor metrics for evaluating code quality. The only way you're going to know about code quality, especially when it comes to numeric computing, is reading the source. Do your homework, right? Know what you're buying before you buy it. So this is all really sad um, and a bit unfortunate. But people have identified this problem. People have. There are people within the community, in fact, um, there are a few at this conference. If, at tomorrow, evening, or tomorrow afternoon, you'll see a talk by Mikola, who's worked very extensively on bringing math to JavaScript. There's Philip Burkhart, and then as well as myself. And a project that we've been working on for the past year and a half is called StandardLib, that basically aims to provide uh, very high performance and rigorous and precise algorithms for doing numeric computing streams and utilities. If you're interested in it, go to standardlib-js, standardlib, um, and if you want to take a, just a quick peek, what you'll find in it is you'll find a lot of your different implementations that you might expect out of a standard library. Everything from trigonometric functions, special order functions, utilities, random number generators, working with distributions and streams, et cetera. It's even some machine learning stuff in there at the present moment. So definitely take a look. So that said, what are the opportunities? How can you push this agenda forward? The first thing you can do is you can get involved. You can follow Standard Lib, you can follow on Twitter, you can get in touch, and we'll be happy to set you up. The next thing you can do is you can advocate. And I want you to advocate at the standards level, right? And not for things about like, that are basically syntactic sugar, but real fundamental things that can only be implemented at the specification and language level. Notably, int64 support, int128, typed objects, which would make it a lot easier to do complex numbers in JavaScript. SMID, but promoting it with long instead of just short. Right now, it's really geared toward graphics primitives rather than doing numeric computing. Parallelism, right? So better, lightweight multi-threading, uh, multi right? Right now, it's quite heavy because you have to do multi-process stuff. So doing parallel computing is a bit tricky. Yeah? Better primitives for GP, GPU. And then also big float, big end support. Because once you can do that, then you can start doing arbitrary precision arithmetic. 
So with that, um, just want to say thank you. Uh, definitely come up if you have any questions. There's stickers up here if you want those. Um, follow on GitHub, follow on Twitter. Uh, later this afternoon, there'll be a talk at uh, 440 by Philip Burkhart on real-time machine learning in Node.js. Uh, definitely attend that if you want to know a bit more in terms of how you can do uh, math and numeric computing in JavaScript. With that, thank you very much.